we need to have answers and that are scripturally, spiritually valid answers so that we can stand on a foundation without apology to an almighty God and say, God, I want to I hold your hand and walk in the future. To be a healer requires a willingness, an assumption, if you will, on the public's part, but a willingness on our part to be ethical in every single dimension of our practice, of our service. Goodness is a generational phenomenon. Remember what God said to the Jews? If you keep this law, it will go well with you and your children. From my own perspective, as somebody whose faith is very important to him, uh, I have worried that we have not engaged the religious community in some of the serious ethical issues that are posed by the advances in this field, at least not to the degree that we need to. I would like to start by, as I often do, by reading my favorite prayer. So if you would join with me. Almighty God, give me a deep curiosity about all of your creation. Move me to search and to question. Give me insight and understanding, a retentive memory and the patience to ponder and reflect. May I not stop short with knowledge, but proceed to the understanding of the heart and the wisdom to view the world with the eyes of faith point out the beginning, direct the progress, help the completion, through Christ our Lord. Amen. That prayer was written in the 13th century by Thomas Aquinas. It expresses so much in so few words that why should I attempt to speak to my maker on those issues in words that are less eloquent than those. And certainly in talking about multiculturalism, uh, one needs a lot of help, especially in the modern secular university. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, realized, on page 85 there is an outline of what I'm supposed to be saying. Uh, given my usual propensities, it's quite likely that we will end up saying other things, but <laughs> we'll try and stick to that protocol, especially since I only have half an hour. The first point is absolutely important for physicians. You have never seen and will never see a multicultural patient. It's one of the reasons that bioethicists in general are not much help to us, because they believe in multiculturalism. They don't do medicine. Your job and my job when we're seeing patients, I'm not seeing patients these days, but when I was seeing patients, is to elicit from the patient what their particular understanding of the world is, what their particular culture is, and make what use of it I can. To treat a humanist as though he were a Christian would be the height of insensitivity and would be abusing my position, but the reverse is equally true. To treat a Christian as though he's a humanist is an insult, and it's also very bad medicine. Uh, we deal with individuals, and each of them inhabit a particular story, thicker or thinner, as the case may be. We've already last night had some beginnings of the discussion about pluralism and multiculturalism, and it can be nuanced in many different ways. It's true that we have many cultures represented, but not as many as we think, and neither to the degree that we think. The problem, primarily in my view, is that the dominant culture is getting thinner and thinner and thinner. It's still there, in, a, in so far as your patients have views about the nature of good and evil, which is at the heart of ethics, they will still be Judeo-Christian views. In uh, Canada, we still collect that data. Uh, I gather you don't because of various sensitivities about church and state. Uh, we don't have those sensitivities. So stats can every 10 years ask Canadians or a subset uh, a random subset of the, the population, what, what their belief system is. It's due again next year. So the last data we have is from 1991, when there were rather less Canadians than there are Californians. But uh, at that time, Canadians clearly did a very interesting thing. Being very obedient, we fill in forms from the government. But uh, we filled it in backwards, I'm quite sure. What Canadians did, given 70 or 80 categories, is decide what they were not. 
I'm not a Zoroastrian, don't know what it is. Uh, I'm not a Hindu, I'm not a Buddhist, I'm not a nothing, I'm not an atheist, I'm not an agnostic. Oh dear, I must be a Christian. And then they chose Catholic or Protestant. And 27 million odd Canadians at that time, 12.7 million eventually put themselves down as Catholic, 9.8 million put themselves down as Protestant, which is the reverse ratio for you. 3.7 million put themselves down as nothing, no other group exceeded 400,000. Now, do our politics and public policy represent that reality? Not one iota. The figures will be roughly the same for you. It's a very interesting question with residents to say, okay, when you see patients, if the next 100 patients you see are a random cross-section of Americans, what will they believe about the nature of life and death, the relationships between husbands and wives, the nature of suffering, good and evil. And they will not come anywhere near the truth that I have just given you. So it's a good question approach. One of the things that you have to practice in the next few years in dealing with these difficult issues of public policy is never make a statement when you can ask a question. Let me repeat that. Never make a statement when you can ask a question. That is because there's no such thing as a politically incorrect question. They'd love there to be one, and they try very hard, but it always hurts them too much, so they don't do it. I do the most politically incorrect things in very antagonistic environments, but nothing happens, because they, I don't ever actually say what I believe. They know. I don't need to say what I believe. They know. But I haven't said it. So they can't do anything. We must practice that technique. Of course, the world's greatest questioners, Jesus and Socrates. And if you want a modern uh, uh, mentor in this area, how many of you have not read any Peter Kreeft? Oh, how many of you have read Peter Kreeft? How many of you are not with me, you know? Uh, <laughs> he, he writes these marvelous dialogues between Socrates and students, abortionists, professors, whatever. Uh, if you've never read the last chapter of The Best Things in Life, where there's a wonderful dialogue between a student and Socrates about whether objective moral truth exists, get it. You can use it with your youth group at church or your college and careers group. Just act it out. A wonderful instruction. But asking questions is the way to go. Now, the moment you've decided that particular cultures are important, and they clearly are, as I will demonstrate to you in a moment, uh, you've got to deal with the immediate responses you'll get. First of all, you, you will be accused of stereotyping. And you say, no, I'm not stereotyping because I could take you blindfold, put you on an airplane, drop you down in different parts of the world and say, you can't ask a question of anyone, just observe. And you will work out whether you're in a Christian, a Jewish, a Muslim, a Hindu, a Buddhist, or a communist state without asking anyone a word. Therefore, it's not stereotyping. It describes something real. To say that a Muslim has a particular way of seeing the world. It is not stereotyping. We've done that experiment since the fifth century 20 or 30 times. We know what it produces. It will produce something like Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, up through Syria and Turkey, down through Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Indonesia. That's what it produces in the whole of Saudi Arabia. The experiment's been done so often that P is whatever number of noughts you want to put before you get to a digit. That's what you get. It's not going to be different in the future, or not rapidly so. Similarly, if you visit a culture that's rooted in the Bible, Old and New Testaments, you get Western Europe and its offshoots, or the Eastern Orthodox version. If you get the Old Testament, you've got Jewish version, and so it goes on. Cultures are critically important. <laughs> One of the, uh, the things that, that we need to, to deal with, with very clearly here is the, the issue of how we talk about these things, how we unpack them. And there, there are, of course, key questions. Uh, how do you deal with life and death? How do you deal with suffering in each of those different cultures? And we also need to have some shortcut ways of thinking about it. And basically, there's only half a dozen cultural views you need to deal with, and the rest are subsets of them. The way I divide it is, say, the biggest religion in the world, if you don't have 
chronological snobbery is paganism, in which the world is dominated by evil spirits, or in general evil spirits, because our experience of the world, certainly up until relatively recently, was that most of our children died before maturity, crops failed at random. Believing in a God of love under those circumstances is extremely difficult. But believing in evil spirits is very easy, and it provides the explanatory power for life, which is what worldviews and religions are about. It has to explain life and death and meaning. And it does that very well. But it provides no basis for medicine. As I said in the introduction, my, my background is in pediatrics and biochemistry. And uh, my clinical interest has been in severe malnutrition. So I have been very interested in the question of why there has never been a successful nutrition education program in sub-Saharan Africa. If you put into the evaluation requirement that there be no expatriate input for three years before you evaluate. Now, I was involved with developing the, the materials to, to deal with malnutrition in the 70s, and by the late 70s, we'd got to the stage where we went through 110 pound two-year-olds, and we didn't lose one of them. And we doubled their weight on average in 40 days. I mean, it's one of the wonders of the world. To, it's certainly one of the, the greatest joys of medicine is to take a child as near death as you can get and return it to a normal child in 40 days. Now, we thought that that would lead to a reduction in malnutrition. It hasn't changed the prevalence in sub-Saharan Africa in 20 years. So in the late 80s, I had the, the joy of going back to try and understand this. And gradually, I began to understand that the animistic worldview explains n what life is like in Africa very effectively. But if you believe in evil spirits, science becomes incomprehensible because at the root of science is inductive reasoning, which says that experiment done in Chicago will give the same results as an experiment done in London. But if they're different evil spirits, why should it? It's an unthinkable thought. So I could actually train Africans to do what I wanted when I was there. And then I would go away for nine months, come back nine months later, and we'd be almost back to square one. One of the nurses that I had trained to resuscitate malnourished children had his own son die of malnutrition. When I asked him why, he wouldn't look me in the face. He said we didn't feed him properly because he knew that's what I believed, but he didn't believe it. When I sent an African to ask him, he said, no, an evil spirit did it. Now you say, but some things do work. Yes, but the things that work are things like immunization, easily understood as magic. Education isn't. So most of the missionary development activities don't work because one of the things that an animistic culture cannot uh, conceive accurately is the idea of maintenance. How many missionary docks have we got here? Quite a few. How long does a machine last in African hands as opposed to uh, us? You know, I can go within walking distance of the hospital we use as a base and find at least 25 mills that well-intentioned North Americans have brought out there. They see women pained, pounding for eight hours a day and say, that's ridiculous. Next time they come, they bring a little a uh, mill with a little engine, and everybody has great celebration. It works for less than a year. Because maintenance is necessary, we think of it, as human. No, it's a gift of our culture. So animistic paganism is a big one, and we're heading back towards it. That's the problem. Gods and goddesses are beginning to re-inhabit the Western world. You have people like Camille Paglia at Harvard, who says, I'm a pagan, I like it that way. Some, some nights I want sex with a woman and sometimes with a man. She teaches at Harvard. Or Yale, I can't remember, one of those places. And I see it in the students. Let me read to you Jeffrey Satanova's description of uh, the essentials of pagan society. Because he, he says it beautifully. Pagan society, he says, is pantheistic or animistic. Gods and goddesses inhabit the natural world and are one with it. Nature itself is worshipped as divine. There is, no distinct, there is no clear distinction between creature and creator. Again, on a practical level, this means that men worship not only the nature out there, but the nature in here. Their instincts, e.g. hunger, sex, aggression, and more generally pleasure. In thus spiritualizing the instincts, pagan worship naturally tends to the violent, the hedonistic, and the orgiastic. In the gratification of these instincts, violent intoxication, 
temple prostitution, the ritual slaughter of enemies, self-mutilation, even child sacrifice, all these historical phenomena can be understood not as pathological, but as predictable endpoints to the unfettering of human nature. What Dick was saying last night about the fall comes in here. We're doing it, aren't we? Infant sacrifice, 52 million of them a year. It may be done clinically, but it is still the sacrifice of a young life to the unfettered human nature. It's paganism. It should be called by its name, and it has a long history, and it's a powerful explanation of life. Then you can divide the religions of the world east and west. The western ones, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam where the world is created by a God who is separate from it. That gives a reason for doing science, by the way. The Eastern world, God and nature are coexistent. So a wise man who wishes to know God explores that part of nature which he knows best, which is himself. So it's not surprising that meditation techniques come from the East, whereas we are more activists in the West. You take an Indian, from India and bring him to North America as a scientist, he performs much better here than he did there. Not for lack of money, but for lack of ethos. That's why those of you who've tried to work in those environments know how difficult it is. Even with Islam, which means submission to the will of Allah, it is much more difficult to do medicine than it is with us because as one of my colleagues gave me a wonderful example, I was indirectly involved with setting up a dialysis program in Riyadh at one point. And he said, you know, the problem is that when a, a machine stops, people shrug and say it's the will of Allah. And I say, no, it's a fuse, fix it. You see, it's a different worldview. I mean, if we had access, we could go to Saudi Arabia and equip our laboratories from the stuff that's in the corridors written off when it's got a minor defect. Different world. So you don't see multicultural patients. You see patients inhabiting particular cultures. By the way, in the East, Hinduism is the major one, Buddhism the next, and all the others are offshoots. In the West, we have two post-Christian heresies, and they're actually identical in their her heretical basis. One was communism, and the other is market capitalism. They both have the same heresy that Dick pointed out last night, an inadequate respect for the fall. Communism would work perfectly if we were altruistic. Market capitalism will only work if we are altruistic. When men make 15 million or 15 billion dollars a year and don't realize they have a duty to give all but a few hundred thousand away, we're in trouble. We could collapse as rapidly as Russia for exactly the same reasons, lack of virtue, lack of ethics. And it's beginning to be apparent. You go to Russia, they're aware of this. So the longest question period I've ever had in my life was in the University of St. Petersburg. An hour's talk, five hours of questions. Can you imagine it? Explicitly Christian. What I said is it that, you, that communism did, and they, get, they gave it me in one sentence. Communism destroyed the meaning of the word trust. Now you look at the way we're moving in market economics towards contract more and more with less and less responsibility to one another, how much depth will the word trust have to your children and mine? Talking to my son who preached his first sermon last week, he's actually a maths uh, graduate but he, he's taking two years to do an internship in a church. I wish I'd been able to do at that stage, he's at least ten years ahead of where I was at his age. But he began by talking about the alienation of his generation, who cannot even enter into many things that I find rich. You know, we, Jonathan and I were watching uh, the BBC Pride and Prejudice film last Christmas, and he said, you know, many of my friends could not watch this film because it would have no content for them. The idea of manners and courtesy in that kind of way, and the nuances and, and sensitivity of that, play, uh, that novel, completely lost on them. I, as I've said many times, teach highly intelligent barbarians who do not even understand their own language because our language is deeply run all through by threads of Christian thought. Our metaphors are Christian. 
but the students can't interpret them anymore. I actually develop a metaphor recognition test for them. And it's a wonderful test because the older you are, the higher mark you get. I, of course, got 100% because I wrote it, but that's, uh, you know, one of those boring sermons in church one Sunday morning, and I wrote my metaphor test and listened to the... I'm afraid if any of you are pastors, you would hate me. I, I have, for 17 years, I took a book to church every Sunday morning because there was never a sermon that required more than about two neurons. And I... I, I told the pastor that it wasn't rudeness, it was just that I, it was better than going to sleep, and I would tell him what he'd said in his sermon and what he could have said afterwards if he was interested. Uh, it, it sort of stirred him up a little bit, which, which helped. You know. But it's true. It's true. We accept a level of intellectual commitment in our faith which is trivial compared with what we accept in our work. And yet we say our work is of only temporal significance and our faith of eternal significance. The evidence for that, looking from the outside, if I were a Martian, is negligible. That needs to change. We thought this summer that we would run a combined CMDS Augustine College education program for physicians, and it was advertised on Doctors' Digest, but we didn't get enough takers to run. 13,000 American physicians. We only got two who actually wanted to come and be educated. Uh, I hope that's going to change next year. We, we won't give up. We'll try again. We, we want to run a program in which we teach you the history of ideas from a Judeo-Christian point of view, as though the Western world is the product of Jewish thought and Greek thought as modified by the church in modules, showing you how art and architecture and literature and science and math and language all interdigitate, doing it block by block so that if you came ten times or so, you could cover the whole period from ancient to modern. We thought that would be very attractive. Apparently, it's not as attractive as we thought it would be. That's sad. That's sad. Nothing would be at a lower standard than what you had from Cardinal George this morning. So you work hard for a week. So if that's the background, we have patients coming from these different cultures and the two post-Christian ones that are dominant in our world now and this gradually thinning Christian story. See, evangelicals think that when you're converted, you are good. No. When you are converted, you are redeemed. Goodness is a generational phenomenon. Remember what God said to the Jews? If you keep this law, it will go well with you and your children. This is consequential. What we do works out in what we get in our society. For society, actually, virtue is more important than redemption for, in the short term. For you as an individual, obviously, redemption is more important than virtue. But redemption that doesn't lead to virtue is dead, according to James. And virtue it comes from inhabiting an informative story. And it's important which one you get. If you inhabit a Muslim story, you get a Muslim society. Now, you can illustrate that. Many of you will recognize uh, this phenomenon. Uh, not so very long ago, I gave a lecture in a Mennonite community in northern Manitoba. And the doctor who invited me there took me to his home afterwards. I gave my talk and they raised their money. That, that was not the interesting thing for me. But we drove into his house. And he left the, the car in the carport, he did, in the garage. He didn't lock the door. He left the ignition key in the car. He didn't lock his house door. I said, is this how you live up here? I said, isn't leaving the ignition key in the car going a bit far? He said, oh, you never know who may need it. You see, in that Mennonite community, they don't listen to the government. They teach the Ten Commandments at home, in school, in church. Kids growing up there enculturate the Ten Commandments. Our community knows thou shalt not steal. And if you do, everybody says, why would you do that? We don't do that. The result is, their policing costs are minimal. You know, I went to South Africa last summer and saw the technological solution to this problem. They have an epidemic of theft there. Uh, cars are stolen and everything's stolen. And we were driving from one place to another, and as we got out of a rather nice car, the guy hit a little button and the front of his Stereo came off and he put it in his pocket. The controls were in a wafer-thin layer. The technological solution to the problem of human nature. Not a patch on the theological solution. Works. Nobody steals a, a stereo with no controls. <laughs> but 
That's not the way it's meant to be. But that's where we're headed. You can see it. You didn't, when you grew up, many of you, lock your doors. Now you have devices to protect you. In due course, you will live in prison to keep the thieves outside. Go to the developing world, you'll see it. Cultures matter. Now, how did we then get to the idea that all cultures are equal? I mean, it's patently absurd. Let me just tell you one story which will demonstrate that there's not a single multiculturalist in this room. Uh, many of you have heard me tell this story before, but this is for those who haven't. It's not. Use it. I, I tell you, it, it stuns your colleagues. Because lots of them think that multiculturalism is a sensitive, tolerant way to live. And I say, there's no doctor worthy of the name who's a multiculturalist. And I only have to tell you one true story. And it's this. Say, a few years ago, I saw a child with a septic knee. The only thing that could be done was an amputation. So we told the parents that, and they said, um, we need to think about it. I said, not very long. This child's septic. She will be dead. Within half an hour, they said, no, we will take her home to die. And they proceeded to do that. And I was the only person who was horrified, because this was in Africa. The missionary surgeon who would have done the amputation was busy. He was gone. And I was left with the nurses who clearly were not disturbed. The decision that had been made was culturally acceptable and honorable. I said to them, do you mind if I talk to you because I'm upset? They said, no. So I said, what would, providentially I asked the right question. I said, what would these parents have done if this had been a little boy? Now you know the answer. Oh, they said, they would have done the amputation. I said, why would you treat little girls and little boys differently? And they said, in our culture, it is a woman's job to till the fields, fetch the water, cook the food, and bear the children. A woman with one leg cannot do those things, so she will have a life not worth living. Any of you still multiculturalists? Raise your hand. Now, I used to say no one ever had, until about 18 months ago, in Oregon, where else? A female medical student raised her hand and said she would honor the cultural story of those parents. Now, this is where objective moral truth starts. The rubber starts to hit the road. You see, you're all arrogant enough to say we know better. And of course, you don't need ethicists to tell you what is right, do you? You just need to be confronted with the, with the options to know. What we have got from our cultural history about the relative value of little boys and little girls is gift. It's gift that comes from the gospel story explicated over 2,000 years. Other cultures have things to teach us. Those Africans will not believe that we in North America have homeless, working poor. They say, surely a rich nation like yours can help one another build a house. Now, who's got that one right? They have, haven't they? It is an insanity to have $50,000 cars running around the streets and homeless poor. We will be judged for that. We need to do something about it. Thank God some Christians are. But like abortion and other things, we are reticent. We have been intimidated by the culture. And we have to get over that. So multiculturalism is not true. It is not difficult to decide what is right. There are all sorts of things in our society that we don't accept. There are things we accept now that we didn't before. Does that mean it's all relative, which is what they teach in the anthropology department? Because, of course, this leads into relativism. Now, it doesn't mean that it's all relative. The way to talk about it, I think, is to talk about cultural stories. There is such a thing as objective moral truth. I don't claim to know it on every occasion, but it clearly exists. It's easy to demonstrate. Every one of you in this room has had the experience of having a lie about yourself come back to you. Hopefully, you've also had good, true things come back. In other words, you've experienced subjectively an objectively true statement and an objectively false one. So our moral universe has got dimensions, falsehood to truth, love to hatred, honor, dishonor, fidelity, infidelity, justice, injustice. That, that's our moral universe. It has been like that since day one. When you get to truth, that's the end of the line. There's nothing beyond truth in that direction. When you get to falsehood, you don't get any worse. It, that's where it stops. The trouble is that ideas of truth and justice and love and fidelity are big ideas. 
I mean, we've been writing about them since writing was invented, and we're still struggling with them. So you can't work from first principles every day. What you do is you inhabit a story. The story gives you shorthands. It, it tells you how to behave. Now, you don't even think about it. Because you've been brought up in a culture that's deeply infused with Christianity, that's the way we think about these things. That's the shorthand. All societies, for instance, have an honor code. You can't have a society without an honor code. Even we say thieves have honor codes. They're just different codes. If your business went bankrupt in North America 50 years ago, what did you do? Well, you sold everything you had, reduced yourself to poverty, paid as many debts as you can, and then somebody came up and said, that was tough, here's 100 bucks, get started again. That was honorable. What do you do now? You employ a lawyer to see that you pay as few debts as possible, and then you go and ruin another company. And that's honorable because we allow it. What did you do in Japan? You committed suicide. You see, honor exists in each place. The cultural story used to explain honor is different. The same with love and trust and justice. It's richer or poorer depending upon the story. Because you see, a story is infinitely nuanced. You read it again and again, and each time you get something different out of it. The gospel story hasn't changed since it happened. But our understanding of it is constantly changing. Doctrine is a human creation, guided hopefully by the Holy Spirit, but clearly we change. I mean, the problems vary from time to time. There wasn't a full-length book on justification until the mid late Middle Ages. All the early theological books were on baptism. You can think about why. The, 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 the focus of the society changes with time. Now, unfortunately, we forgot that. And sadly, it was Christians who were responsible for the undue elevation of tolerance in our society. You see, following the Reformation, Catholics and Protestants thought the way to convince the other side was to chop off their heads or beat them blue, you know? We were pretty violent. The Thirty Years' War was one of the worst wars the world ever saw. And it was humanists who stopped it. They said, since you guys can't agree, we will take religion out of the public square and we will tolerate different religious understandings. Now, what they didn't take out of the public square, of course, was all the ideas of virtue that came from religion. They kept those, but they, they ceased paying interest on them. Our governments and our scholars are way behind on their payments for all the things they honor, like ideas of justice and truth and all the rest. It all got suppressed, so that in your society, you even had the framers of your Declaration of Independence having their ideas turned on their head by the Supreme Court. They said church and state must be separated to keep the state from interfering with the church. Now it means the church can't say anything to the state. It's the church's job to interfere with the state. We have no armies. We're not going to do anything violent. We're just going to destroy them, that's all. <laughs> now, this... What, what happened then is tolerance became more and more important. And the difference between cultures, in my view, is largely in the hierarchy of goods. We all agree about similar things. If you look at these cultures, they all agree that killing is wrong, but they differ about where you draw the line. So the Somalis, for instance, will kill someone from another clan who takes water from their well. They won't ask them to stop. They'll kill them. Go read Thesiger's Desert Sands, and you get a description of it. You see, only Jesus said you shall love your enemy. All cultures say you mustn't kill your brother. But the definition of brother changes. The cultures determine how we work these things out. We need to start thinking about this deeply. We can't correct this by teaching students ethics, or even doctors' ethics. When I give ethics lectures to students, they always come with a warning. I say, this lecture on ethics may turn you into an amateur ethicist but it will not make you ethical. In fact, the most ethical people usually know nothing about ethics. As one of my colleagues puts it in the philosophy department, I only teach ethics, I don't practice them. He's honest. No, what makes you good is what you don't think about. What you do when no one is looking. Your character. Have you ever noticed that Paul understood this? The early church, he said, must choose leaders not on the basis of skills, but on the basis of character. You go to 1 Timothy 3, there isn't a single skill in the list. 
I used to think there was one, apt to teach. But being apt to teach is not a skill, it's a gift. Because you, knew, you need two things to be a teacher, neither of which can be taught in the Faculty of Education. One is a passion for subject, and the other is a passion for the pupil. Those are both gifts. Without them, you cannot teach. So tolerance became more and more important. And yet, you only have to stop and think for a moment to realize that tolerance cannot bear the weight that we're trying to put on it in the Western world. It is not what I call a primary virtue, it's a secondary virtue. Hopefully, none of you tolerate murder, rape, theft. You, you make the list. The ten intolerances would be a perfectly good name for them. And in fact, it's not a bad idea to talk about them that way. It really starts conversation. Tolerance is being abused in our society. Dorothy Sayers describes tolerance brilliantly, so let me read it to you. Uh, it's not totally honest, because Dorothy Sayers always likes a little bit of rhetoric, but this is nevertheless brilliant. She said, the church names the sixth deadly sin acedia or sloth. In the world, it calls itself tolerance, but in hell, it is called despair. It is the accomplice of the other sins and their worst punishment. It is the sin which believes in nothing, cares for nothing, seeks to know nothing, interferes with nothing, enjoys nothing, loves nothing, hates nothing, finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, and only remains alive because there is nothing it would die for. That's where we're headed. And why are we headed there? Because we, as Christians, are not doing what we were called to do. Remember what Jesus said? You are the salt of the earth. And if the salt has lost its savour, it is good for nothing except to be cast out and trodden underfoot of men. Now that metaphor was much more vivid then than it is now. Because he was talking about rock salt. A mixture of calcium salts, dirt and sodium chloride. It's used to preserve meat and fish primarily. So the housewife would go to the market to buy her salt. Taste the top of the sack to see that it was salty. But if it had stood in a puddle, what would happen at the bottom of the sack? Of course, the sodium chloride is leached out, but the calcium salts remain. The volume is kept, but the saltiness is gone. Then she preserves her meat and fish. What happens? Very shortly, there's a nasty smell. Does she blame the meat and the fish or the salt? The salt. You see what Jesus is saying? When you turn on the radio, or God forbid, the television, and you see what horrible things are happening, and you say, what will they do next? The next thing is to confess and get on your knees. If my reading of that text is correct, it's our fault. When the world does evil things, it does merely what comes naturally. It is the Christian's function to preserve what is good and to destroy what is evil. And Jesus has another sting in the tail of that statement. He says, when we cease to be the sort of people who stand up for what is good and attack what is evil, we become salt without taste and we are good for nothing to be cast out and trodden underfoot of men. What he's saying is if you're an unsalty Christian, you lose on two heads. See, if you know it's true but you don't practice it, you have no joy when you're with salty Christians because they make you uncomfortable. But because you've declared yourself as a Christian, the sinners don't want you because you spoil their fun. I mean, sin is pleasant, but it endures but for a season. That, said Oscar Wilde, is the perfect definition of a sin, something you have to do again. He was wrong, of course, as usual, but said it brilliantly. We are unsalty Christians, and until that changes, we will not be joyful. Now, my time is gone, and I have got only halfway through the process. The thing that I wanted to go on to is the question of how virtue is produced in different cultures. But all I can do is suggest if you're interested, you call CMDS and they have a tape of mine called Why Are There No Hittites on the Streets of New York? It was a gift to me uh, and hopefully, well, it won't quite be a gift because CMDS, being American, sells it, you know. I'm quite pleased, actually, when they sent me a check for royalties, that changed my view. But, but thank you for your attention.